In the previous video, we looked at a relationship between dividing up the simple shapes, the line, the square, and the cube into smaller shapes and found a way to relate the factor that we divide the shapes up into, the number of pieces we end up with, and the dimension of each of those objects. And with this equation, we can use this to figure out the dimension of various fractals. Now, we chose to divide these into thirds. We split each of these lines into three different pieces, but that choice was arbitrary. We could have chosen a different scale factor. In fact, if we look at dividing these pieces up into two instead, we can now say our scale factor is one over r, or in this case, one half, we can divide each of these into two and we'll still find the same relationship. So let's quickly divide up these shapes. And notice that for the line, we have two pieces that it was split into. For the square, we can count that there are now four pieces. And for the cube, we have one, two, three, four cubes up top, and there are two rows of that which means we have eight total cubes, smaller cubes here. And we can see this equation still holds since the dimension of the line is one, the dimension of the square is two, and for a cube that is three dimensional. And applying this equation, we see that two to the first is two, two raised to that dimension, which is the second dimension, is equal to four, the number of pieces, and in all of these, when we take the scale factor, or r from the scale factor, which is two, we raise it to the dimension, we do get the number of pieces that this is divided up into. So this equation holds no matter what our scale factor is equal to. And let's now apply this equation to the Koch snowflake. And for that, we will need to make a little bit of room. And let me first rewrite the equation. We have r from that scale factor raised to the dimension of the object. And this is equal to n, the number of pieces. Now with the Koch snowflake, we know it starts from an equilateral triangle. And then each of the side lengths are divided into three equal pieces where that middle piece is replaced with an equilateral triangle. And let me start by just drawing out an equilateral triangle and we can go from there. Now, this is not drawn perfectly, but let's assume this is an equilateral triangle. All the side lengths are equal to each other and all of the angles on the interior, those are equal as well and are 60 degree angles. Now, with the Koch snowflake, we really just need to focus on one of the sides and determine what happens to it. But if we remember from the videos on the Koch snowflake, it's formed by taking each of these sides and splitting them into three equal pieces. And in the middle piece, we replace it with an equilateral triangle. Though this line here is then deleted essentially. And we would do that on each of these sides. We would split them into three equal pieces and then place an equilateral triangle where the center piece was, where again, these lines are now no longer included. And that process will carry out infinitely many times. For the next step, we would take each of these new side lengths, which are one third of the original size, and split them into thirds where the middle side will then be replaced with an equilateral triangle. And again, once that triangle is put in to the middle third, the inner line is then deleted. And so that it's a more open figure. And to determine the dimension of this object, we really only need to consider one side and one of these steps, since all the steps will just repeat the same process. So let's focus on this side and we can redraw the two steps. The first step, we just start with a line, but the second step, we will take this line, split it into three, and then 
replace that middle section with essentially two lines, one that goes up and another that goes down. And these lines would form an equilateral triangle if this inner line actually remained. So we can call this step zero. And let me quickly draw the first step. And again, this won't be drawn perfectly to scale, but we can get a general idea of what's happening. Remember that with this starting line, we split it into thirds and then drew this equilateral triangle where we removed this intersection. But the key point is that each of these segments is one third of the original size segment. And we now have, if we count them, we now have four pieces. And that means that our n value, the number of pieces is four. Our scale factor, which remember is one over r, is now one third, which tells us that r is equal to three. And from here, we have enough information to plug this into our equation, and we can solve for this variable d. So let's set that up. We have that three, our r value from the scale factor, is raised to the dimension d. And this is equal to the number of pieces, which is four. Now, this is an exponential equation. We're asking ourselves, what do we raise three to to get four? But another way to phrase this is that this is logarithmic. We can set this up as a logarithmic equation. And you might remember that when we have something, let's say a to the b is equal to c, the logarithmic version of this exponential equation is that log base a of c is equal to b. And let's now use this idea to rewrite this as a logarithm. We can say that log base 3, since that's the base of the exponential equation. And then we have our input, which is what the exponential equation is equal to, that's four. And this is equal to D, which is the exponent. And remember that logarithms are just exponents. And from here, most calculators will not have the ability to put in a custom base and a custom input. Most calculators only have buttons for specific bases, namely base 10 and base E. But some calculators actually do have the ability to put in logarithms like that. But let's assume we don't have a calculator like that and we have a more common calculator. For that, we will need the change of base formula. And when we have a logarithm with a base that again is not 10, which we call the common log, or e, which is the base of the natural log, then we can rewrite this with essentially whatever base we want. Where let's say we want to have log base 10, which is the common log, we can put the input up here, and then we'll divide by a logarithm, again, a base 10, but that will have an input equal to the original base of the logarithm. And log base 10, you might see on a calculator, is just log, where the base is implied to be 10. So this just becomes log 4 over log 3. Or we can write this with the natural log. With the change of base rule, as long as the base is the same, and you put the input up top in the numerator and the original base and the denominator, then this base can be whatever we want it to be. And we can write this with base e, which is the base of the natural logarithm, where again, the original input goes up top and the original base goes down below. Now, usually we won't write log base e. We will write this as the natural log, ln of four divided by ln of three. But all of these are equivalent. And if we plug this into a calculator, what we get is that the dimension D is 1.261859. And this number will go on forever since it's an irrational number. So it doesn't have a pattern in the decimals.